To introduce the President's Lecture, I welcome to the podium Alberto Lerdini, the ISB President. Thank you, Lenny. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, Tony Arndt, in addition to being a nice friend of mine, performed his undergraduate studies in New Zealand and Australia in biology and human movement science before receiving a scholarship for a PhD at the German Sport University in Köln. His PhD involved complex studies concerning asymmetrical loading of the Achilles tendon. This line of study continued at Karolinska Institute in Sweden as a postdoc. At present, Tony Arendt is a professor in biomechanics at the Swedish School of Sport and Health Science in Stockholm, where he has been also dean of the research and doctoral education board for six years. His specific interests are now in function of muscle tendon units in the lower limbs, in athletic footwear, and in sport biomechanics. He has published more than 90 peer-reviewed scientific articles and has supervised 10 PhD students to completion. In 2018, Tony was awarded of the ISB lecture at the World Congress of Biomechanics in Dublin, and in 2020, he was awarded the Swedish Senior Prize for Sports Science Research. But this is all in the public domain. Uh, what we may not know is that he is leading right now the important working group on athletic shoe structure. This works for the World Athletic Institution uh, to check whether elite athlete shoes meet their rules and regulation. For this, they are very busy these days during Olympic Games because they have to report on the shoes they receive from Japan after the competitions. Impressive. But this is the presidential lecture, so I want to add something more. Tony has been the president of the International Society of Biomechanics until yesterday. And I want to tell you all that in these two years, he has guided this community very professionally, very carefully, and very smoothly. He has faced the pandemic crisis with the necessary caution, accompanying the society through the pillows, achieving the fact that the really minimum effects have been suffered by the society. In addition to this, he was in charge for the 2021st Congress, and after a first thorough plan, plan in presence, he and the team had to move to a totally new event, online, something that no one had approached before in ISB. Eventually, a fantastic Congress has been arranged for which Tony and the local team would have deserved our full presence in person, also for the beautiful city and the very warm welcoming they have. For all this, the society is particularly grateful to him. Sony, Tony, so the stage is yours for a time much longer than what you have had these days in the introduction, but you definitely deserve it. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Tony Arendt. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto, for the kind and very flattering introduction. I'm really proud to be able to give this President's Lecture at the ISB. Uh, when I first started thinking about what I should say tonight, the, the topic seemed pretty obvious. That I talk about the difficulties, challenges, and hardships that we've all gone through during this one and a half years of the COVID-19 pandemic but I didn't want to. I wanted to conclude this Congress on a positive note and maybe be able to inspire some younger biomechanists instead. So before I start my lecture, I'd like to show a short film that we've made to try and show some respect for the feelings and frustrations that we've all had in this last one and a half years. But maybe also to instill some positiveness, some optimism, some hope that we might be through this soon.
The title of my talk is Life, the Universe and Biomechanics. It's pretty bombastic, but I thought this might be one of the few times in my life that people might listen to me, so I thought I'd give it a go. What I'm trying to do in this talk is I want to go through some personal attributes, some characteristics and ideas that I find important, that I've identified in my years in biomechanics as being important for open, original, high-quality and honest science. I'm going to talk about the importance of being inquisitive, how important it is in science and biomechanics to innovate, to be innovative. Something that's very close to me, that, that is to be international, the importance of internationalization. And another thing that I really burn for, that's scientific integrity and research ethics. And finally, something that we all, of course, know, uh, the importance of being inspired, but also maybe the possibility to be able to inspire yourself. So starting off with being inquisitive. When I was doing my PhD in Cologne, in Germany, at the Sport University, with Peter Brueggemann as my supervisor, I got a scholarship to do a PhD on loading of the knee during alpine skiing. After about a year in which I hadn't really done much, we were walking along a corridor one day with Bernie Segesser, a orthopedic surgeon, very well renovated orthopedic surgeon from Switzerland. And Bernie mentioned that he was surprised or confused why were all the patients that he operated with chronic Achilles tendon injuries, why were most of these injuries on the medial aspect of the tendon? And this just brought up this inquisitive question, why, why should there be something loading or strain or some aspect of a tendon that is more on one side of one part than the other. We've always just thought that the Achilles tendon was one force being transferred from the muscles to the bone. So this just lit a spark and I was, became really inquisitive as to why this is. As we all know, the Achilles tendon is pretty complex. Uh, there are three muscles that go into it. One is the soleus, which is a uniarticular muscle, which only crosses the ankle joint. And we have two muscles that cross the knee joint and are biarticular, the two gastrocnemii. And this is important because there's three different forces that go into the tendon. And already there, you can imagine that there may be some asymmetry in the loading in the tendon. But on top of this, the bone into which the tendon inserts, the calcaneus, not only moves a lot in plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, but also in the frontal plane, in inversion and eversion, meaning that kinematics of this bone may also be pulling on the tendon in different uh, positions more than in others. And that this then can lead to something very complex, which is the tendon load. So I started off, and this was in my PhD about 100 years ago, uh, looking at non-homogeneous Achilles tendon loading. And I did a very simple experiment, thanks to some collaboration that we had with the anatomy department at the University of Cologne with the late Professor Jürgen Köpke. I got a cadaver foot, which you see from behind in this image. So it's the calcaneus you're looking at here. And the foot is bolted very rigidly to a metal plate underneath it. We divided the tendon into two, so we, the medial lateral parts were separated with just a simple cut, and we built some strain gauge based uh, force sensors, which we put on the medial and lateral aspect. The whole foot and the muscles were inserted in a materials testing machine, which could pull on the three muscles individually or in any configuration we wanted. And just very simply, I'm not going into detail into any results in this talk, but we could see that depending on whether the soleus or medial or lateral gastrocnemius were being pulled, there were differences in the medial lateral loading, and we could also pull on two of the gastrocnemius together or the whole triceps surae as one muscle group. And all of these produced different medial and lateral forces, indicating already there that the muscle forces could produce different loading in the tendon. Thanks to the fantastic network that Peter Brueggemann had, I also had the honor of working with Pavel Kormi, whom you only see from the top here, uh, who ended up being a really good friend of mine as well. Uh, and we got to use the, at that stage, very new optic fiber method that pa Pavel had designed and uh, was quite common in his department in Uvascular. Uh, a disadvantage with these digital presentations is that I can't have a laser pointer that you can see, but I assume that in the left-hand picture you can see the optic fiber passing invasively through the Achilles tendon. 
of this subject. It's a very simple idea that there's light going through this fiber, and you can calibrate the reduction in light that happens when there is force on the tendon. So the force on the tendon compromises the fiber, and the light is reduced, and you can um, calibrate this to the force in the tendon. And my idea was to build this contraption on the right-hand side here, where you could change the knee angle, but the ankle angle was steady at 90 degrees. This meant that we could change the mechanics or the length of the gastrocnemius while keeping the soleus the same length. And we did an experiment where we looked at different knee angles and therefore gastrocnemius lengths and the forces in the tendon and concluded that due to the differences in the muscles, forces that were possible, there were also non homogeneous loading in the tendon for those parts responsible for tr force transfer from soleus and gastrocnemius. But we, didn't, we couldn't localize them because the optic fiber, I don't think, ever got used with more than one in the tendon at one time. So we couldn't actually look at different areas of the tendon. I've continued with this work, as Alberto mentioned, uh, using a new method called speckle tracking, ultrasound speckle tracking, which actually comes from echocardiography and a few years ago was still relatively new to use in musculoskeletal applications. But we thought we would try this on the Achilles tendon and you can see the setup on the left, quite simple, a normal ultrasound probe um, put on the Achilles tendon and the foot firmly attached to an isokinetic dynamometer, which did a just a simple dorsiflexion, plantar flexion movement. Uh, you can see the EMG electrodes on the muscles there as well. The idea there was to control that they were completely passive. So this was a passive movement of only just kinematics. So there's no muscle forces, well, minimal muscle forces involved. The picture looks something like the one on the right that you get from the ultra, ultrasound, where you can see the Achilles tendon placed between the subcutaneous tissue and the skin on the top and the soleus muscle on, underneath it. And just to orientate you a bit more, there's the superficial part then and the deep part of the tendon, which I'll be talking about in the next couple of slides. Uh, the idea with speckle tracking is that you can define manually regions of interest in the tendon. And in this case, you can see picture A, in which we have three regions of interest defined in the tendon. The yellow one is the most superficial, then we have a blue one, which is in the middle, we call it mid section, and then a deep green one. The movement on the, the graph on the right, the B, uh, is one plantar flexion to plantar flexion cycle. And you can see that when the tendon is in dorsiflexion at the top of the graph, there was clear differences in the displacement of these different regions of interest. And interestingly, we found that the deep part of the tendon, which was the green region of interest, moved the most. There was the greatest displacement in that. And the superficial part, the yellow dot, was the least. And as you can see in the graph below, that's just an indication that this was also repeatable over multiple trials. Uh, and we could see this in all the subjects. You, if you have, can read through this really quickly, <laughs> you can see that in every subject, the superficial is less than the deep, the displacement that we found, and the mean, obviously, as well, with about two millimeters difference in the superficial to the deep. And something that we then, from then on, have started calling non-homogeneous displacement. This is an article I'm particularly proud of because this result up here meant that it got rejected from, I'm not quite sure, I think it was two or three journals because the reviewers basically didn't believe it. They didn't believe this result. They thought this was a, uh, a mistake that was made in the data due to the method actually being meant for heart tissue and that in the tendon there's probably something else happening through the algorithm and that this probably isn't true. Uh, in the end, we did get it published in in 2012, and what's been really, really nice in, for my, my career and my carrying on with this, just this part is that it's also been confirmed in a, a lot of studies since then. One of the first ones was this one by Laura Slane and Daryl Thielen in 2014. Uh, Hazel Screen also showed this in her keynote yesterday. And Laura found the same thing, that in a number of different, it was both eccentric and passive movement in this case, uh, at the bottom of the graph on the right, you can see that there's greater displacement in the deep part compared to the superficial, which is at the top. And Jason Franz took this a bit further into more applied, 
uh, movements with some walking at three different speeds and found once again that the dotted lines here in all of his trials, there was greater movement in the deep part of the tendon than the superficial. So it's been confirmed in a number of movements and there's been more studies since then as well. Interestingly though, uh, Laura Slane also looked at not old, but at least middle-aged people compared to young people and found that the non-homogeneous displacement, the non-homogeneity in the tendon was less in the middle-aged people compared to the young. And Orsa Fröberg, a PhD student of mine, uh, looked at patients post-operatively, Achilles tendon patients post-operatively, and found that in the operated tendon the non-homogeneity was also less compared to the contralateral healthy tendon. So both of these indicate that maybe young, healthy, viable tendons should have this non-homogeneity compared to maybe older or diseased tendons. So we've come up with a hypothesis, which I'm not at all saying is proven, but this is an idea that we have. If you look at the animated model on the left, uh, we have a similar movement to, we just, to what we just had in the isokinetic dynamometer with a passive dorsiflexion plantar flexion movement. If you look at the green line next to it, that's an indication of Achilles tendon length. So plantar flexion is shortest. When it's most dorsiflexed, obviously it's most strained and the tendon is the longest. So in this case, without any muscle activity. If you then move over to the picture on the right, where it's basically just zoomed in, but the same movement. Uh, and I'd like to draw your attention to the part within the yellow ellipse, where you can see, I hope, three red lines within the tendon. These are just an indication um, of the superficial, deep, and mid portions that we've seen in the previous ultrasound pictures. Uh, same movement. So it's a passive dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. The tendon length again indicated by the green line on the left. Uh, and if we now look at the red lines, you can see that they are all the same length when plantar flexed, but dorsiflexed, the deep is longest. So indicating the greater displacement that we've seen in the speckle tracking data. So differences in how much they strain or displace depending on where they are in the tendon. Obviously not all movement in the ankle joint is passive, so if we now look at the muscle activity, we can see something similar. We have the arrows indicating muscles contracting, uh, one for the soleus and one for the gastrocnemii. Again, the green line indicating tendon length, and we have, in this case, a contraction of the muscles pulling on the tendon. And again, once, I mean, once the muscles are contracted, the tendon will be longest. I didn't do a zoomed in picture of this one because I thought, I mean, it's the same thing as the one that you just saw before. Instead, we've done a simplified animation of it with a structure, we can call it a tendon, between two blocks. So if we call a vertical box a tendon, we again see the three lines. And if we have a movement and the red lines constrain differently, they will stay intact. However, if the movement occurs and one part of the tendon cannot strain differently to another, you'll get a rupture in that part that's supposed to strain more due to the movement. It's really simple. But that's, that's the hypothesis, that there, this is useful for the tendon to be viable, that one part can do more displacement than another part to avoid injuries such as this. So it appears that it's important for the Achilles tendon that there is this non-homogeneity. And this has been found in a lot of studies now, as I mentioned, and in different activities. The importance and relevance of this is pretty poorly understood still. But there's an influx of studies coming now. I just saw one in the last oral session uh, in Jason Francis' group. So uh, there's a lot of work going on with this now. And they, they do show this gliding between parts of the tendon, as also shown by Hazel yesterday. But there is an indication that this non homogeneity is impaired in older people and post-surgery. So we propose as a hypothesis that non-uniform deformation provides a biomechanical advantage to the tendon. And this may be useful for injury prevention and maybe even for performance, but there is still a lot of work to be done. Um, 
following up on the question I asked Hazel yesterday, I thought I'd just show something depend, um, talking about sub-tendons. I I've strongly believe that in Achilles tendons in humans, there aren't sub-tendons, because what I was talking about is that, I mean, we have muscles attached here. This is a human Achilles tendon. The soleus muscles are attached here. No, that's the wrong way around. Gastrocnemius here, soleus obviously here, and they pull on different tendon plates. And these tendon plates are at some stage very, very firmly attached to each other. And I can follow just visually a fiber from the muscle down to the, uh, to the calcaneus, but there's just no way I can actually dissect them apart. So I agree with that there's sliding and that there's different parts of the tendon displacing more than others, but I debate using the term subtendon for this, in humans at least. Just thought I'd mention that. We can talk about that later, Hazel. Okay. So, the importance of inquisitiveness in science. In my case, I was looking at, because of what Bernie Segesel said, I wanted to see if there's asymmetric load. I, I was just curious. And we just did it at the start to see whether there are regional differences in different parts of the tendon. And now, 20 years later, there's strong indications that this is relevant, both functionally and clinically. <laughs> so, innovation. Uh, in, from my perspective, the innovation that I've been involved with has been most, mostly within biomechanical methodology. And this has been mostly applied to the foot. We wanted to know how the small bones in the foot move relative to each other. What is the intrinsic kinematics of the foot and how, how can we describe this? Just as a bit of background, you all know the foot has many small bones uh, and very few of these bones have bony landmarks on the skin surface which would be appropriate for defining the bones with skin-based markers, as we do with a lot of the other body segments. Some of the bones, in particular the talus, which is of course a very important and one of the bigger bones, does not even approach the skin surface. So you can't even have a marker on the skin which represents the talus. During walking or movement, you might even have a marker that's on one bone that during the movement moves onto another bone. So you can't even represent it like that. The segments, the bone segments, are irregular. Geometry, there are some long bones, there are some square bones, there are some curved bones, um, all sorts of geometries. And that also means that they have very irregular joint surfaces. And the movements are quite different between the different bones as well, and very difficult to understand with standard foot models with external markers. On top of this, the foot is subject to very high accelerations, for example, when you're landing from a jump or even running. I mean, there's high accelerations which might be making the skin movement artifact quite considerable. When I came to Stockholm as a postdoc, uh, that was thanks to Arne Lundberg who brought me here. And Arne was a completely, or is a completely fantastic orthopedic surgeon with a huge scientific interest. Uh, and he had had an idea for many years after discussions with a lot of people, including Ton van den Bogert, about inserting metal pins into the bones because then you could represent exactly the bone that you want to look at. And you could, still use skin mark, uh, you could still use markers, reflective markers, but not on the skin. You could have them directly anchored into the bone. So I'd just like to show you a quick video of the methodology that Arne came up with. Is there a doctor in the house? Brilliant. <laughs> uh, so, so basically, we have these pins, which are pins that are normally used in hand surgery. Uh, Arne is completely fantastic, and I have to say that he's unique in the whole world with this method to be able to do this. It's not as simple as it looks to just find a bone and drill a pin into it. You, there's quite a few things you have to think of. Uh, and he, at the most, we had 10 pins in 10 different bones for some of these experiments. 
The pins are then cut so that they're not too long because there's a risk, obviously, that they might hit each other when the bones move. And then we attach triads of reflective markers, as seen in this picture, onto the protruding end of the pins. Uh, and these triads can then be used like any other skin marker set. Uh, we need at least three markers per segment to define the orientation and position of a segment in 3D space. Uh, so basically, the, the kinematic methodology is the same. The, the way, that what is so unique is the attachment of the markers to the bone. We often combine this with computer tomography, and that's not only to see that Arne put the pin in the right bone, uh, but also the pictures are quite pretty. But the important thing with these is that we could, by knowing the movement of the markers on the pins, we could then also animate the whole foot with the shape of the bone re represented by the CT pictures. I'll show some images from some other methods later showing that. Uh, important here is that this was a huge project that we did quite a few data collections and it was always very big logistics effect. Uh, with the team from Salford University in England under, with, or with Chris Nestor and also a team from ETH in Zurich with the late Alex Stuckoff very involved. But mainly you can see in the background here behind everyone else is Arne Lundberg who we have to thank completely for all of the data that's available from this. Just a quick example of a couple of applications. If we didn't have such a method, at that stage at least, maybe it's changing a bit now, but at that stage there would be no way, for example, to see the movement between the talus and the navicular, between the navicular and the first cuneiform, and the first cuneiform and the metatarsal at the medial longitudinal arch. But by having pins in all of these bones, we could define this. And just one example of the results, of course, we could still have skin markers as well. So we had a skin marker set which defined the rear foot and the forefoot. And that's the red curve here showing the total dorsiflexion plantar flexion during, during a gait cycle or during a stance phase. Uh, but we could also cut this up into the three different joints, which you see in the uh, less bold lines, the blue, green and black line. So it just gave us an indication we could, for the first time, actually see how much dorsiflexion plantar flexion occurred in each of these and added up to the total rear forefoot motion. Just an interesting aside here was that there was a temporal phase shift in which of these joints was most dorsiflexed from the most um, yeah from the most which was that proximal to distal. With, shown with the red, uh, black arrows there. But we could also just look at total ranges of motion, and this is very, very basic science, and once I'll go back to what I'm talking about with the inquisitive science. We just wanted to know. Uh, it was important that the data was there for people to be able to use for other applications. Paul Lundgren, a PhD student, uh, looked at walking with this, and you can see the joints that he looked at it marked in green in the images above. And I did a study on running. Well, it was pretty slow running. We've never had people sprinting with these pins in. And the interesting thing, we, we thought intuitively that there would be a greater range of motion in running because it's more dynamic. But the thing that was really interesting with this study, we thought was, and I'll just highlight the medial longitudinal arch joints, that we found for all of them that the range of motion in walking was greater than in running. This was opposite to what we had thought. Maybe it makes sense now, because we've, I mean, it's quite obvious the system is more stiff in running than in walking, and when it's a stiff, stiffer system, the foot won't be moving as much within itself. So the intrinsic joints won't be moving that much together. Um, but the, the data here is from 13, 14 years ago, so it, the idea was pretty new when we first showed that. Another method that we were using, or Arne used for his PhD thesis, was RSA, radio stereometric analysis. A similar idea, um, it's also invasive. You insert small metal, which are made of tantalum, beads into the bones. Once again, three markers in a bone means you can define its position and orientation in 3D. And so Arne could insert these beads into whichever bones we were interested in with an injection mechanism. So the, bone, the markers are actually firmly implanted within the bone. Uh, I'll just, once again, digital, I can't show with a laser pointer where these beads are, and in case you can't see them properly, I've done it a bit more subtly. 
they're there. And the idea, the reason why I'm showing, I can go a little bit more into detail. Um, th this method is based upon x-rays, so you need a double x-ray setup. You take a still picture of the foot, then you move the position of the foot and take another picture. And if, by having these two pos positions, you can do, for example, helical axis rotations between these two images. So you're not actually showing the movement, but you're showing what's happened between the pictures. So it's a quasi-dynamic setup, as we call it. But the most important part with this picture is that I have these markers in my foot, so I think I've got 29 in there, and they stay in there. And that meant that Mike Rainbow, who's now become a very good friend at that stage, I think he was only interested in me because I had markers in my foot. Uh, but they've got this fantastic new laboratory in Kingston in Canada uh, with a double X-ray dynamic system. They're not unique with this anymore. There are other universities, but I think he was one of the first ones to have it. You can see the X-ray tubes on the bottom there, on the side of the walkway. And obviously with this, you can then do a dynamic X-ray movement analysis. And what they're getting into there, which you might have seen in the markerless versus marker debate, is markerless um, X-ray images. So markerless of the bones in the foot during walking or running, whatever they were looking at. But this needed to be validated. And by having these beads within my foot, I was a good subject to have because they could also digitize these markers and see exactly what was happening and compare it to their markerless data. So just a little video of what it looks like. Now that's obviously not walking. I'm doing a hop there. Uh, once again, you can't actually, I think, on this image see, but there, in the calcaneus there are three markers, with these tantalum beads. So they could look at this with their markerless me um, methodology, but also with the beads inside there. Just another picture there. On the left, you can see a... Oh, I now stopped it. You should have seen a walking trial there, but I stopped it before I even hit the ground. Uh, once again, it's a two, two video tubes. I don't think I... Maybe I can back. Oh. Uh, you would have seen the two X-ray images of, of me walking through the field of view. On the right-hand side, what I was talking about earlier, the possibility of using computer tomography to also then see, see the shapes of the bones during this motion. And this is what they then use for their markerless uh, calculations of, of kinematics or whatever they're interested in in the foot. Uh, really excited that Lauren Welter, who was working with Mike at that stage, has just recently published the first paper out of this data, and there's hopefully lots more coming. It's a fascinating data set, also due to the fact that there are these marker beads in there. In, in the bones. This is probably unique. I don't think I've seen any other presidential lecture where the president shows him or herself in underwear, but I thought I'd show this anyway. Uh, this is again the same setup, but this time I just want to show that they're also working with knee work. So I'm doing a lunge. And the field of view is extremely small, which is a disadvantage of this method. You really have to hit the, exactly the right space where the two X-ray tubes are, are located, uh, which you can see here, the two X-ray views. If you look on the right-hand side, I wasn't allowed to go further forward than that because it would have gone out of the field of view, so it was pretty difficult. Uh, but then also, once again, the final product is then a video of the actual bone segments uh, showing the rotations and this could again be validated because I happen to have beads in my knee joint as well. Uh, concerning the work on the foot, on the intrinsic kinematics in the foot, uh, in ISB we've got this possibility to do recommendation papers for, on any issues that we feel it's useful to have international recommendations that scientists and biomechanists around the world can use. So I took this initiative to write a recommendations paper on skin marker-based multi-segment models. What I'm really grateful for is that Alberto, after I'd taken the initiative, took over all the work. And we ended up publishing this just really recently, a few weeks ago. Uh, because it's, it's useful, there are so many foot models, many labs use their own model, and it's sometimes difficult to talk to people and know whether the results are comparable, and it's hard to compare to the literature sometimes. So we wanted to do this for main, mainly young scientists. We're not saying you have to use this model, but we're saying with the model that you use, look 
after some of these aspects. Some aspects that make sure that your data will be correct and good and comparable to others. So this has just been published and I'm really proud of it. I hope that it's very useful for a lot of people and we've also got a poster here and thanks to the organizers having everything open for another 30 days, you've got lots of time to look at this. Post number is PA050 by Alberto. So, the importance of innovative, and I've added methods here, because in my case, as you can see, it's based mainly on methods. And it's also based mainly on the intrinsic kinematics of the foot. We started off just once again wanting to know how and how much the individual segments move. But now it's been cited a lot. A lot of this, especially Paul Lundgren's walking article, have been cited a, a lot for, for, uh, compared to most of my other articles anyway. Uh, because anyone doing foot modeling needs these data to be able to compare. And it's also got clinical relevance if people want to use the data to look at that. And along the lines of what Scott Delp said in his keynote, these data are available. People have contacted us and want to use the data for some other questions. And I'm, you're welcome to do that. I mean, the data are still available. And Peter Wolf had a presentation now, which was a new, new aspect of the data. So yeah, it's still there. And it's fantastic because it was so innovative. It might be outdated now because the work being done with dual X-ray is getting better and better, but it was definitely very unique data. Internationalization, something that I think is essential for good, open, critical science. This is my journey abbreviated a bit. I'm Australian. I did my Bachelor of Science in Biology at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Then I stopped studying completely and went skiing for two years in Austria, but decided to go back and study and did a Master of Science in Human Movement, human movement at the University of Wollongong in Australia before getting a scholarship to go to the German Sports University in Cologne, Germany. After my PhD, I then got a postdoc at Karolinska Institute in Sweden and have been stuck here since then. Thanks, Anna. <laughs> uh, so, so I did each of my degrees in a different country and I really believe that's helped me a lot with where I've come and what I've been doing and how much I've enjoyed it as well. Uh, I've got a little story and I think it's very relevant with this COVID-19 situation that we have now where Hardly any of you are here. Everyone is watching it digitally. Once I've finished speaking, or maybe you already have, you'll just turn off your Zoom, and that's it. I was invited as a keynote lecturer to the Sports University in Shanghai, in China, in September 2019, so just a couple of months before we stopped traveling. And our Chinese friends, they, they invited us out after the keynote lecture, and I sat next to another keynote lecturer, and we had no clue who we were, but we started talking and we had a beer together. <clears throat> um, uh, after a while, we realized that we had lots of common interests. Uh, he, he's a medical responsible person for uh, sports medicine at World Athletics. His name is Stefan Bermond. And we talked about shoes, we talked about injuries, we talked about ethics and rules, and, and it was just really fascinating. After a couple of weeks, when we were both back home again, I got this phone call from Stefan that World Athletics was having real problems um, regulating new performance enhancing shoes, which all of the people winning all of the big races were wearing at that stage, and there were no rules in place. So he sent me a pair of shoes that somebody had just worn, said, can I look at these? Um, do, do I think they follow rules and so on? And for the next few weeks, we tried to word some rules and they were put into the World Athletics rules for what people are allowed to wear. Since then, or I'll cut a long story short, at the moment, anyone that breaks a world record in track and field has to send their shoes to my office and I see if they follow the relatively simple rules that World Athletics has at the moment. And that would not have happened without that beer with Stefan in Shanghai. And I, I think that's really indicative of how important it is that we actually meet properly. It was completely random, but wouldn't have happened with the way we're doing a meeting here this week in in Stockholm or digitally. So uh, just an indication, I think it's imperative that we start getting back to that when we can. There may be possibilities to combine with digital, but we definitely need this personal uh, meeting space as well. 
Uh, just a little continuation of that. There's now some work going on to maybe make these rules a little bit better, a bit more applicable. And I'd like to thank the cooperation of Laney, who you all know here, and also Stefan Hallström from uh, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. So together we're looking at maybe developing methods for better regulating shoes. But here I also, of course, have to mention the International Society of Biomechanics. Without the conferences and the friends and colleagues that I've met during the conferences, I mean, I just don't think biomechanics would be anywhere near as much fun or even on my modest level as good as it is by meeting these people. I've been at every Congress since 1993 in Paris. Uh, I was Secretary General from 2008 to 2015 got elected as president in 2017 and have been president till, until yesterday when Alberto took over, took over. So it's been a long time and a lot of involvement there and it's just been the highlight of, of what I've been doing. It's just so much fun and I really recommend everybody to be involved in the ISP and hopefully meet up in Japan in two years' time and continue this fantastic group, this fantastic community and family that the ISP is. A quick, quick summary of internationalization and why I think it's important. I probably need a button. I think it's, I think it's probably the most stimulating way to get into any research. I have my ideas. People in my group have their ideas, and we, we talk about the same stuff the whole time. But if we don't get somebody from outside or move outside to talk to somebody else, or work in another laboratory and see the methods and techniques that they have in their line of thoughts, then I don't think we get anywhere near as stimulated. It helps us to expand. We have our methods, but I, I don't have any of the methods, for example, that Mike Rainbow and his group in Kingston have. And by going there, I can expand my arsenal of, of methods, what I know, what I understand, and of course also the data that I can get and the questions that I can explore. So again, it's new methods, but it's also on a cultural level. Everyone in different countries have different cultures. Even different laboratories have different cultures. So I think it's just vital that we go out and understand these and learn these and get influenced by them to just make everything that you do a lot more high quality. I believe. And as I mentioned, it's also scientific attitudes that people have, that they're different in different countries. Uh, so I just think it's a very expansive way of doing things. But it's not only academically or scientifically. I think internationalization is also extremely important for personal expansion. You as a person grow by meeting people internationally. And I think that's really important and it's maybe one of the most interesting things for me within biomechanics. Integrity. This is a big one. I mean, we could talk for an hour just on this, or, or lots more than an hour. Um, for me, integrity includes research ethics, but also academic misconduct or scientific misconduct. And these are two things that I've been quite involved with, especially from the perspective that when we first started showing our bone pin data with the invasive bone pin method, a lot of people sort of laughed and said, yeah, but you're from Sweden, so of course you're allowed to do that in Sweden, but we can't do that. And I, I, I disagree with that. We are in Sweden, and we can do it in Sweden, but that's because we have Arne, not because of the research ethics boards. Because research ethics is based upon an evaluation of risk versus benefit. And if we can see that the risks in our bone pin methodology are not particularly large, and we can show that from experience, we've never had an uh, infection or we've never had any other complications due to this, then the benefits are obviously bigger because we have great scientific data and then there's no ethical problem there. So I, I think that's, that's when I got really interested in this because people were often saying that at conferences that um, it's great and it's unique, but that's only because you're the only ones allowed to do it because you're in Sweden. Um, so that, that was around the start of the year 2000s, and from 2007 I've been on the National Ethical Review Board because of this interest that was, that's grown since then, uh, and have been there for, what's that, 14 years now, so really experienced also how ethics has become more and more important because of a lot of scientific issues that we've seen. 
If this wasn't digital, I could see all of you now, and I'd ask you to raise your hand if you know who this is, but I can't see many of you. There's actually four hands up here, so oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> uh, this is Paolo Maccarini, who about 10 years ago, I'm guessing a bit there, but I think it's about 10 years ago, was employed and recruited at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, and it was a huge hype. I was at Karolinska Institute then, and everyone thought they had a future Nobel Prize winner, and everyone was just dying to be with Maccarini, and he's an extremely charismatic person, so it was really, really exciting. And what, what he did, and what he was famous for, is that he had bronchial tubes, or he, he operated on patients with cancer of the bronchial tubes, and basically he made synthetic bronchial tubes and covered them in stem cells and then inserted them, he operated them into the patients with the belief that they would then grow themselves into new bronchial tubes. Uh, and this was, I mean, it's fantastic, imagine that. Of course it's a Nobel Prize. But it, it was a catastrophe. Every one of his patients died. Uh, and he, when people then looked, they realized that there was no ethics approval for this. Uh, it had all been more or less a hoax, and maybe the, it's the biggest crisis in academic misconduct that Sweden's ever had, and had huge consequences for KI, where the whole board had to leave. Macchiarini, of course, is not here anymore. Um, interesting story is he, he had a very, very high opinion of himself, and he promised his wife that he'd get the marriage would be done by the Pope, for example. Uh, apparently the Pope didn't know about this, though. They actually asked him. Uh, so a really fascinating person, but maybe not who you'd like to help, who you'd like to help you with integrity in science. The good thing that came out of this is that it was the start off to, for Sweden to realize we don't have anything in place for this sort of thing, and they established a national board for review of academic misconduct in 2020. Uh, and I'm proud to say that out of 10 national members of this board, I got voted as one of them, or in, included as one of them, and it's probably the most exciting, interesting academic work that I'm involved in. It's really fascinating seeing some of the reasons why people get, uh, why people claim that others are academic, academically misconducting themselves. Because a lot of the time it's just people that don't like each other. They start saying something, and then you have to find the ones that really are based upon something c concrete and correct. So it's really exciting work, and I'm really enjoying that. So, scientific integrity. If you're talking about research ethics, I think it's important to go back to the basics. If you look at risks versus benefits, of course there's other things involved as well that you have to look at, but that's the main one. And if the benefits are larger than the risks, then you're on a pretty good, on, you're pretty much on the road to fulfilling research ethics. I won't go into this too much, but the, the definition in the board in Sweden for academic misconduct are that you have falsified, fabricated, or plagiarized work. Uh, and I think that's pretty international. There are other things you can do as well. I mean, there's lots of ways you can be academically incorrect. But this is what the definition is. And I'd like to just lift the whole thing again as well, that in both cases, research ethics or misconduct, I think we have to learn to respect human values, respect each other, and be able to work together. And this is something that we've also seen in the Advancing Women for Biomechanics sessions that we've had at ISB now. Uh, just, just this being able to work together and respecting each other and helping each other that rather than trying to um, get every, put each other down. Finally, this isn't new for anybody. Of course, you've been inspired by lots of people. Hopefully, you can also ex inspire others. Uh, I'd like to come with a quote here. It's from Sir Isaac Newton. He said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. I should actually be quoting Joe Hamill here, because he was the one that said this about three nights ago. Uh, but I, I brought it up from Sir Isaac Newton, because I think he said it a little bit before you, Joe. <laughs> uh, I'm not claiming that I've seen that far, but I, I could modify it a little bit and say, if I hadn't been allowed to stand on the shoulders of giants, I wouldn't even have seen this far. And I'd just quickly like to talk about a couple of giants. I mentioned my 
Master of Science uh, in Human Movement Science in Wollongong. And that was together with my supervisor, Peter Milburn, at that stage, and Julie Steele, who was co-supervisor, but I'm not actually sure if that term officially exists, but she was helping the whole way through the project. And they really got me into sports science, which I'm so thankful for. Uh, both of them have also been heavily involved with ISB. Peter was on the council for a long time, and Julie was both secretary general and pro uh, president of ISB, and has followed me, and well, we, we sort of contact very often, and they, they just really inspired me into this field. And Julie, when we were students, she already said, all of you have to be members of ISB, and it's just, it has helped a lot of us a long way. Peter Brueggemann, of course, my PhD supervisor, uh, for, for everything he did, uh, he inspired me the whole way through my PhD. Fantastic group and fantastic laboratory that we had there. Jürgen Köpke, the late Jürgen Köpke, I mentioned briefly, he really raised my interest in anatomical work with all the cadaver work that we were allowed to do there. It has been a real honor to work with Pavel Kormi, uh, both his methods but also his group and the laboratory there. We still have a lot of collaboration at the moment. I'd like to, I already mentioned Arne Lundberg, can't mention him enough for the intracortical pin work. My PhD student, Orsa Fröberg, that just finished recently, who took this speckle tracking on the Achilles tendon to a whole new level. Alf Torstensson at the Swedish School of Sport and Health Sciences, who was my mentor until he unfortunately passed away only a few years ago. And then there's three men there, the three people that have just inspired me the whole time. Uh, first, I was pretty scared of all of them because they're just such big names. Uh, but all of them have helped me in, in different ways and inspired me, and maybe especially Joe, who is sitting here now, who right from 1995 when I was doing my PhD and we had the footwear biomechanics group in Köln, has followed my career and helped me and was the past, pre was the past president until I became it yesterday. So thanks, thanks a lot for that, Joe. So to round up, I hope that some of these ideas, none of them are new, but I think they're things that I've identified that are really important to be able to conduct good science, to enjoy it as well, and make sure that it's something that everyone else can respect. The, to be inquisitive, innovative, international, show integrity, and finally, to inspire. <laughs> Just another couple of quotes to finish off. I'm getting into this with quotes. And this is a bit more, it's not so much on what I was talking about now, just a bit more on being president and maybe a bit of leadership. It is a well-known fact that those people who most want to rule people are, ipso facto, those least suited to do it. And that sort of feels quite good. Maybe, maybe that's why it's okay for me to rule people a little bit, because I'm not quite sure I really want to. The next one's a bit more problematic. Anyone who is capable of getting themselves made president should, on no account, be allowed to do that job. Uh, yeah, I, I somehow was capable of it, so I'm not quite sure. So maybe it's good that I don't have the job anymore anyway. Both of these come from the great scientific mind, Douglas Adams, and the book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He's actually got another quote, which I think is relevant for today. The knack of flying is learning how to throw yourself at the ground and miss. I think that's great. It shows, go out and do it. If you've got an idea, go out and try it. It doesn't matter if it looks riskful if you don't know what the solution or the conclusion is going to be. Give it a go, and then on your journey, you can try and learn how to miss the ground. Very finally, tonight we should be at the ISB banquet. It's planned, that was on the program, we had it all booked and everything. Unfortunately, we're not having a banquet, but last night a few of us at least went out to dinner, and we had a lovely dinner. It was Brilliant weather has been all week, uh, as we promised in Calgary. We were going to have good weather this week. Uh, and the people we, that were out for dinner had a great time, and it was really beautiful, and it's just a shame that all of you couldn't be here. But Alberto, our new president, was there, and you can see how happy he was about that. So thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, ISB, for having me as a president, and I wish Alberto good luck with the continuation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Tony. 
uh, I've been uh, looking to uh, the chats uh, and there are only enthusiastic comments for this talk. Uh, it has been very inspiring, very motivating. Uh, actually, there is people in the audience which is uh, still concerned about your feet after no, all of these experiments, <laughs> so they want to know if there is any uh, side effect uh, uh, now from, from those experiments, just to no. Uh, no. No. <laughs> Very simple answer, but none at all. No. Okay. Now, the other interesting question is, uh, well, about the motivations. So, uh, I've uh, seen that you've been very much involved in your research uh, and you have uh, inspired uh, quite a lot uh, uh, in those working with you. Uh, one question was about uh, what was the fact, the event, uh, the uh, people that has in, in, uh, motivated you the most in these, uh, you know, longer career? I'm not quite sure I'd like to lift one person out of that whole list, because in different ways they all have. I think maybe the one that I grew most under was Peter Brueggemann, because I think for many of us it's a long time that you do your PhD, and you're a long, it's a long time that you're stuck with your PhD supervisor, and I'm very fortunate to have had Peter, and I think that's where I, it was the steepest learning curve I had was during the time with Peter Brueggemann, and he's, he's still a good friend now, and so he's been very important for me. Okay. I think we uh, want to thank you very much for your you know, lecture. We've been amazed about uh, your story and what you have been uh, achieving. Uh, there is a, an acknowledgement from the <laughs> organization <laughs> for your for Thank your you lecture. very much. Thank you. Thanks, Alberto. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Do you want just me to go now? No, you can stay there. Okay. I'm just here to remind you that we will start the awards uh, awards session in, let's see, a little more than 17 minutes. Thanks very much. Thank you.